Uh, thank you, and thank you for the uh, invitation. Uh, so it uh, will be nice to to talk to you. Um, and if you have some specific questions or if something is unclear, please uh, let me know in some way. So uh, the the uh, the title of the talk is mid level representations and domain specific geometric estimation in computer vision. So I will go through uh, these things and, and talk about what I mean by, by uh, these things, and also discuss some recent uh, work that we have done within this field. So I will talk about geometric methods related to computer vision uh, and how we can use that in some special applications. But I, I, I think I will just start by saying uh, something about uh, where I'm from and, and what we're working on in general before I go into uh, more of the technical uh, things in the talk. So um, so um, I'm at Lund University, and that is in uh, Sweden. So this is the small red dot down in the uh, corner uh, in the south of Sweden. That's that's where we are. So we're located close to Copenhagen uh, and in the south of Sweden. So this is a general uh, around thirty thousand students at Lund University. It's quite old. It was founded in sixteen sixty six, one of the oldest in in Sweden. So here you can see the uh, main university building. And you can also see the pillars here uh, in front of the, the uh, building. And we will get back to those. Uh, so uh, part of this talk is about these pillars in, in on the building here. But we will get back to that. So uh, more specifically, I'm from the math department. So we're in a slightly newer building. Uh, this is the uh, math department at the university. So this is uh, where we work. Uh, so this is, uh, we have teaching and research for, for uh, and it's a mixed, um, mixed uh, department with both uh, natural science students and also engineering students. So we have quite a lot of uh, students from, from different engineering programs. That's the main focus uh, for most of us at the math department. So quite quite uh, applied uh, work that we do. And especially uh, here, I'm from a division, which was uh, sort of quite recently organized. Uh, but it's we have had a, a larger research group uh, for quite a while. But now we have formed also a division here. So, so we're the division for computer vision and machine learning. So that sort of tells you uh, basically what field we're working in. So we're around eight senior researchers, uh, professors, assistant professors, and uh, associate professors, senior lecturers. Uh, and then we have, uh, yeah, it's very slightly. Now we have three postdocs. We have around 15, 16 uh, PhD students. Uh, working uh, in the division, and we also sort of supervise uh, around fifty uh, master thesis students per year. So that's roughly the the size of of our uh, department, and uh, yeah, who we are. Um, so what do we do? Well, we do computer vision and machine learning. So, but that's a very broad subject. So you can say that we have more or less three uh, directions that we mainly work in. Uh, so one uh, part is doing uh, geometric estimation in computer vision. So from images, we want to do 3D reconstruction and uh, model camera motion and so on. Uh, and then we also have people working on more semantic 
uh, modeling, so uh, problems uh, based on detecting things, classifying things, tracking and scene understanding, but mainly from, from image data. So images or videos, we from those we want to extract information in some way, detect uh, what's in the images, uh, classify uh, what the actions or, or uh, content of the images and so on. And then we also work quite a lot on, on medical applications. So we uh, have quite many who are working on, on medical image analysis. Uh, and that could be, for instance, uh, analyzing images, uh, finding and segmenting uh, parts of the, the uh, body, uh, working on, on diagnosis help. So looking at, at uh, shapes and so on of organs and trying to say if there's something uh, wrong with them. Um, and also with, with uh, my microscopy images, uh, looking at cell samples uh, to detect the uh, cancer and so on. Uh, and, and working on different modalities uh, for different kinds of, of uh, modalities from, from medical images. Uh, like X-ray inspect and so on, MRI and so on. So those are sort of uh, the basic things that we in general work on. So I myself is mainly uh, working on, on uh, 3D reconstruction and geometric computer vision. So just to sort of describe the types of general problems that we work on, well, I should say also that we're, we're sort of uh, so so uh, traditionally, computer vision uh, is located, well, it can be located in many different uh, types of departments. Uh, so nowadays, maybe most are at a computer science department, uh, but many are at electrical engineering or control departments. Uh, maybe not so many are, are situated at the math departments, uh, but as such, we are sort of more focused maybe on, on the modeling aspects uh, and looking at, at connecting uh, the problems to, to more general mathematical areas for, for and using linear algebra, using optimization methods, using geometric estimation, matrix theory, and so on, to apply that to, to general problems within computer vision. So that sort of uh, could be something that that separates us from 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 other departments. But in general, we're working on on the same type of applications. So uh, just to give you a feel for for what types of general problems, not not directly application uh, wise, but but in general, what's what's a typical problem that we try to work on? So one. A uh, basic problem is within 3D geometry is that we have images of, of a scene. Um, and this is called the structure for motion estimation problem. Uh, so we want to estimate some unknown 3D structure. So we don't know the shape or, or uh, format of this 3D structure, but we have images uh, of it. And we also have unknown camera, so we have maybe two images of a scene uh, looking at uh, that scene, but we don't know where the cameras were when they took the images. So there's an unknown coordinate system change from the cameras to the 3D scene. And this is something that we need to estimate in order to also estimate the 3D structure. So this is the most, I guess, the most general prob problem uh, if you have images. So we will look uh, later on how we can look at problems where we have, for instance, the camera motion, but not the 3D scene, or we have the 3D scene, but not the camera motion. So I will talk a bit about those problems also, uh, but this is sort of the, the most general structure of motion problem. And then this uh, the, the, the cameras could also entail having some calibration parameters, the focal length and so on. So that could also be known or unknown uh, and could be needed to, to estimate that. And we could have priors on the motion. We could have priors on the, 
a 3D structure and so on. So the, there's, there's a lot of variation to this problem. But if we look at the sort of most basic general problem, we can look at the two view geometry. So typically what you do in a traditional, or uh, if we want to solve this problem, uh, images contain lots of information. So if we want to solve this geometric problem, typically what you do is that you start by extracting features from the images. Uh, and these are typically uh, points in the images where there's lots of variation. So lots of structure where the, the there's variation in, in the image. So typically around edges or corners and things like that. And we do this for uh, the two images. And then in order to infer something about the geometry, we need to match these points. So we look at one point in one image and we try to look for that point in the other image. And typically you have some description of the surrounding of that point, that local structure of the image, and you try to match that in some way to, to the other image. And this will give very noisy matchings like you can see here. So uh, many of these matches are uh, wrong or even most of the matches are wrong. So we need some way of, of uh, handling this. So this is also a big part or a big problem with this type of, of framework that we need to separate the, the good matches, the inliers to the bad matches that don't follow the real motion model that we're trying to estimate. So how can we do this? Well, we need to model the geometry in some way. So if we look the, at the images, uh, we can look at them within the 3D structure. So these images are taken somewhere. Uh, and if we look at specifically one point in one of the images, this point, uh, what we know about this point from this camera's perspective, we know that the 3D point, which projects to this point is somewhere in space. And it's a long array that goes through the focal point of the camera uh, through the point in the image and out into the 3D world. But we don't know how far away this point is. So we don't know the depth of the 3D point. So that's, that's basically the information we have from one image. Now, uh, if we look at this, uh, if we know where the other camera is, uh, we can look at all the points along this 3D line. So all the points uh, that could be potential uh, 3D points for this left-hand point, these points are on a 3D line. And if we know where this second camera is, uh, this 3D line will project to a line in the other image. This is called the epipolar line. Uh, so what we know is that the corresponding point should lie on this point here, on this line. And if we know the correct true correspondence, we can uh, put this ray also into 3D space and the intersection will be where the 3D point is. So if we know the matching and we know the positions of the two cameras, we can estimate the 3D point by triangulating these rays. So this is the traditional way of, of finding the, the 3D point. Now, the problem is that we, we don't really know the matching. So, um, if we assume that the 3D point is on another depth from the left-hand image, then that point will end up uh, on a different place in the second-hand image. So if we don't have the matchings, we can only say that uh, these points are on, on, a, on a line. But this is basically how you code the 3D geometry. So we can code this by the rotation of, of the, the uh, camera and the translation of the camera to some fixed coordinate system here. So if we fix the coordinate system uh, by putting the, the uh, one of the cameras, the second camera in this case, uh, at uh, the origin and looking straight at the set axis, this is basically coding the, the geometry here. Uh, 
uh, and this is this is typically the the information that we use when we try to estimate these things. So they, these when you do this, you can then uh, put these together, uh, these different uh, 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 these different um, um, tools. Uh, so and then we can do large scale reconstruction. So. Typically, in a system for doing structure of motion for a large scale scene, uh, what you need is you need some form of initialization. Uh, and that is typically based on this geometric estimation. And it has to be robust because we have very many bad matches. And within this framework, we need to be able to estimate camera poses uh, from the known 3D structure. Uh, and matches, and we need to be able to triangulate points. And then typically we also want to uh, make refinements of our model parameters. So all the camera parameters and all the 3D points, we want to adjust those so that the, the uh, uh, reprojections in the images look very nice uh, and close to the actual estimated image points that we have. This is something called bundle adjustment. But basically, it's a nonlinear process or nonlinear refinement based on some Newton method. But it, it doesn't work if we don't have a good initialization, and it doesn't work if we have many outliers. So this is, this is, these are the problems. But if we have done this, then we can do this uh, for a large scale uh, environment, and we can uh, do a reconstruction. So this is a system for doing this. So this is the cathedral in, in Lund. So we have lots of images taken of, of the cathedral, but we didn't know where the cameras were, and uh, we didn't know where the 3D points were. So these, this is, shows the, the reconstruction after we have gone through all these steps here. So these are quite standard uh, things today, and there are lots of systems uh, for doing this. So this, this was done quite uh, a number of years ago. So there are systems for doing this. Uh, and so the question is, uh, what are the problems that we face today? So the, the, uh, one of the things that, that we're interested in now is, is the gap between these 3D reconstructions and what has been done uh, within classification and semantic understanding of images. So during the last years, uh, we have seen a great improvement in how we can interpret um, images. So we can extract um, information uh, from images in a much richer way during just the last couple of years uh, with the new neural methods uh, based on deep learning, transformers, and so on, that are extremely good at extracting high level information from images. So this is, for instance, uh, last year's segment anything module uh, that can take an image and we just say, uh, do a segmentation of this image, basically saying that we should just uh, divide the image into relevant parts. And this method is very close to what most humans will do given an image like this. So it's a very, it's not a well-defined problem, but there is sort of a consensus among humans what, what is a good segmentation. And these models are very good at this, at this point. So they give out information which is very relevant and which is, is very close to the human understanding uh, and the human counterpart of, of solving such a kind of problem. And uh, these are two uh, other examples. Uh, on the left hand here, you see uh, tracking of, of animals. So you can do specific uh, applications where you have some specific problem that you want to solve. You can train these models and you can get very good results. So here you can do uh, estimation of, of different motions of these cows. So they're doing... Uh, headbutting and, and things like that, that cows do, uh, sniffing body and so on. Um, and, and these models are, are quite efficient, but they are working on a very high level. 
So they don't say that much about geometry. You can have some specific uh, geometric estimation, like in the left-hand side here, uh, where you actually model uh, some, um, also gives a model of, of, of the, the cow shape. And we can estimate people and, and where they are. So you get some geometric information, but there's still a gap between these models that are on a very high level semantically and the geometric estimation, which is on a very low level doing point-wise estimation. So this is what we want to uh, work on and that we're working on currently. So we want to bridge this gap between geometry, which is based on very sparse point features and the interpretation on a higher level. So these are often done using post-processing based on learning and not on geometric estimation. So we want to sort of bridge this gap between semantics and geometry. Uh, and one thing that we can say about these things is also that there is, uh, that we don't have to go up to the very highest level of interpretation. So there is, we argue, something in between these very sparse point features and the actual semantic understanding. So here we can almost all agree on that we're seeing a cup on the left-hand side. So we make uh, an interpretation, a semantic interpretation of this object. And we can also infer the 3D shape. This is a 2D image. So uh, from what I said before, we, we need many images to do the 3D reconstruction, but we can also do that in our heads using, using prior models. So we do an interpretation. Uh, we, we say that this is a cup, uh, we label it with a semantic label, but we also infer the 3D geometry of the cup. We can see the cup size and, and cup shape within 3D. But if we turn to another object, uh, this, is, this is an object which we don't have a name for. So even if it's an object that you haven't seen before, you don't recognize it, it's just some, some random shape, we can still infer the 3D shape. So there is still something which is not based on sort of sparse point features and 3D reconstruction, which is happening in our own brains. And this is based on some form of mid-level representation. And then this is what I mean by mid-level representation uh, in the title. So we would like to try to, to find methods that can do 3D uh, on some mid-level uh, representation using shapes that are not uh, necessarily just 3D points. So this is difficult. Uh, and it's not clear exactly how you should do this. So uh, what we have done is to start by looking at specific use cases. So we will, I will go through a specific applications that we had uh, and that we looked and tried to solve uh, using some form of higher level uh, representation, which is more richer than than uh, than points, but still not a semantic representation. So this is uh, an example uh, together with a company called Katam, and they are doing uh, autonomous drone uh, forest inventory. So they go around uh, flying uh, with a drone, and they take images of trees and they want to uh, estimate the shapes and sizes of the trees and they want to go back and do inventory and see, okay, how much have, have the trees grown? Uh, what has happened? Are there new trees? Have something happened to, to the shapes and so on? And uh, they have this system for, for going around, uh, working and, and uh, estimating this. So what they do is they have a traditional structure for motion pipeline or a SLAM uh, pipeline. SLAM stands for simultaneous localization and mapping and is typically the real time online version of doing this uh, 3D reconstruction like the, the cathedral uh, that I showed before. So they have a pipeline 
where they do this uh, point-based estimation and then they uh, uh, do a 3D reconstruction uh, on based on the points and they get the camera motion from those points. And then when they have the camera motion, they have models of trees that they want to fit uh, to the scene, and then they estimate these and refine the tree models based on uh, based on the camera geometry. Uh, and this is an offline process. So this is a post-processing where they want to extract the semantic information from, from the images, but then you need the, the 3D information from, uh, from the cameras. Uh, so what we would like to do is we want to do this online instead. So we would like to use the shapes of the trees uh, directly and estimate those and have those as features. So there are lots of, of benefits of doing this. That This means that you can do the actual estimation online. Uh, you don't need the points. Uh, there are a lot, lot less features uh, of trees. So each tree, uh, if we just look at those as geometric shapes, um, then they don't have as many parameters as all the points that are seen in the left-hand image. It's also clear that if you go back in the forest and try to uh, look for the same points, it's very difficult to match these points. So uh, typically, if you go back to the forest a week later, all the ground points have in some way moved, or if you go in a different season, they will look completely different. So it's very difficult to go back to the same scene and try to match your 3D model uh, to the new images. So it would be more robust if we have some representation of the trees uh, to do both the, the geometric estimation and the model. So, uh, we would like to specifically look at cylinders. So this is a new geometric primitive, uh, and we want to use that to estimate the geometry. So in order to do that, we need to uh, have new methods for, for doing this camera pose estimation, doing a 3D reconstruction, and doing this structure promotion initialization. Uh, so this is something that we we're, we're, have worked on, on lately. So, uh, to, to sort of describe one of the things, uh, the contributions that we, we have done and, and why we want need this contribution, uh, I, I would like to say something about how we initialize these models. So typically in structural motion estimation, we do robust initialization using something called RANSAC, stands for random sampling and consensus. And it's a very simple algorithm uh, that is useful to do robust initialization to handle lots of outliers. So we have wrong matchings and we need to root out those wrong matches. So what you do is that you randomly sample a minimal set of data points, so in points in the images, and then you fit your model. So for the first example, you had your rotation and translation, you have point matches. So in that case, you need five point matches and then you can estimate the rotation and translation. So we just randomly pick a minimal set of data points and fit a model. Then we check how many of the other data points agree with this model estimate. And those points that agree with the model estimate, those are inliers to that model. And then we just iterate one and two a fixed number of times. And then in the end, we choose the model which has the largest support. So the largest consensus, which is the most in life. So the model that have most data points agreeing on that model, that is probably the best model. And this is very robust to, to having many outliers. So you can have, even if you have only 10% or 20% in liars, good matches, and 80, 90% outliers, if you just iterate this for a long time, you will uh, find a good model because it will still be that a random model is much worse than a good model, which has slightly more support than random. And just to show you how this example works. Uh, so here, if we have some data points, this is just an example. 
uh, for line fitting. So you can do this for any estimation problem, basically. Uh, it works best if the, the so what you need is a model which has few parameters. Otherwise it, it will not work as well. So here we have a number of points in 2D. We want to fit a line to this point. We could of course just do a least squares fit, uh, but if we have some outliers, that the, those outliers will corrupt your estimate. So uh, the the bad the four bad points here will will corrupt your your least squares estimate typically. So if we do this ransack, we just do the same procedure here. So if we want to fit a line in two D, we need two data points minimally. So we pick two lines at random. We fit a line. We put a boundary on this line and say that, okay, all points within this bound are close to this model. So in this case, we get four in lines. And then we just iterate. So we pick two other points, we fit the line, we look at the bounds and we check how many in lines. So this estimate here gives you much, a, a larger set of, of, of data points that agree on this model. So this model is better than the other. And then you resample uh, and just iterate. And in the end, you will find a good model and you can take those inliers and re-estimate your, your model parameters. So this is basically how the, uh, the uh, ransack works. Okay, so, um, to, so what we have done in a number of papers is to try to investigate how we can do these robust uh, estimates for, for initialization. So in this first example, uh, we look at absolute camera pose. So in this case, we have some known 3D structure of a cylinder. So we know the 3D shape of the cylinder, but we don't know the uh, rotation and translation of the camera, which has taken images of these cylinders. So uh, we want to estimate a rotation that has a 3D rotation has three degrees of, of freedom. A translation has three degrees of freedom. So we have six unknown parameters. Um, and each cylinder in the image will give you uh, four measurements. So each cylinder uh, has two silhouette lines. So in this case, we're only using the silhouette line. So we're assuming that the cylinders are infinite. So we're not using the, that it, you could possibly see the intersection uh, uh, or the end of the cylinder. So these are modeled as infinite cylinders. So this is just a choice that we, we've done. So uh, each cylinder uh, in the image has two silhouette lines and each cylinder, each silhouette line has two parameters. Each line has two parameters. So, so this gives four measurements for each cylinders. So we would need 1.5, so four times 1.5 cylinders to minimally estimate the pose parameters in, in theory. So basically we can take two silhouette lines from, from one uh, cylinder and one silhouette line from, from another, or we can take three silhouette lines, only the left-hand line for, for three cylinders, it doesn't really matter. Okay, and this is the information that we would like to do to construct a method that can estimate the model minimally. And then we can use this in a ransack loop to robustly initialize our camera post estimation. Okay, so I'll just go through some, I won't go into detail, but I'll give some, some, some idea of how you model this and how you can solve this. So, Basically, we have a cylinder in 3D and we have an image of that. So what does that, what, what, what are the constraints that you get from, from this information? So the camera has an unknown rotation and translation with respect to the 3D geometry. So we have, we base our basic coordinate system based on, on the uh, 3D cylinder. And we have meant, so we have more than one cylinder, but I'm just showing one cylinder here. So typically you need at least two cylinders. Uh, so we uh, estimate our data, which is basically the silhouette lines. So we have a number of these silhouette lines. And then we have our 3D 
uh, geometry of the cylinder. So the cylinder can be modeled in different ways, but basically we can look at it as having a direction. So W here is a 3D direction, the, the direction of the, the center line of the cylinder. And then we have some parameters coding for basically the intersection uh, or the cross section of the cylinder. So we're assuming that it doesn't have to be a circular uh, cylinder. We could impose that, but we're just looking at it as a general ellipsoid cross section of the cylinder. So this is the W and D are known. That's, that's the known 3D structure. L is known, but R and T are unknown. And it turns out that, that this separates very nicely. So we get constraints uh, for three of these lines saying that okay, the direction of, of, of the cylinder should be per parallel to the direction of all the lines when we have rotated them. So this basically gives us, us a, a very simple constraint. And the nice thing about this is that it doesn't involve the translation. So we can have this and remember that the rotation uh, is only three parameters. So basically, these are nonlinear equations, but we can estimate the rotation directly using just these uh, equations here for these three equations. So this will give us a number of solutions because it's a nonlinear equations. These are this will be polynomial equations. We can solve them in some way. Uh, we have a procedure for doing that. I won't go into detail how you do that, but you can solve that, and that gives you a number of solutions. And then you can plug that R into uh, the other equation, which, which uh, you get from, from looking at the geometry here. So then you will get a nonlinear uh, equation, three nonlinear equations in T, and then you can estimate T. So this is how we solve these problems here. And this gives you, for three sampled lines, this gives you R and T. And then we can check all the other lines for all the silhouettes that we have in our images and check how many of these work with this uh, model. So the model is R and T, and we can use it in a ransack loop. So uh, we, can, uh, we can check this and, and test this on real data. So this is an example of, of real data. So we have extracted the silhouette lines on the left-hand side uh, in in uh, those are the blue lines. So we have a number of silhouettes and then we match those. And then we try to estimate the, the uh, camera poses for each of these images. So we, we solve this for each image. So we have a number of images here. And the right-hand side shows the top view of the result. So the green things are the cylinders. So those are the trees. Those are known. So we know the shapes and, and the directions of those trees. And then the, the, uh, the uh, blue stars uh, are the, the ground truth positions of the cameras. And the red stars are, are or the red circles are our estimates of the cameras. So this is just showing the translations and on a top view. So it's just the 2D translations uh, and doesn't show the rotation of the cameras, but we also get the rotation of the cameras. So this just shows you that, that it sort of works. Uh, we get good estimates of, of the positions and the red dotted lines are the reprojected lines from our model. So if we take our model, uh, if we take our 3D structure, we use our model camera with the R and T and project those into the images, we get very similar lines as those that we had extracted. So this is what we check in the end, these re reprojections, they should be the same. So this is a way of, of solving this absolute camera pose problems. Uh, we have all, you can also do this to, to uh, look at a, another application. So if you want to register, for instance, photos to a city map, uh, we have, maybe some known building information, we can get a blueprint of a, of a building. So in this, in this example here, we took the, the uh, blueprint from, from a water tower in, in the south of Sweden, and we registered that to, to a 2D map, and then we run our camera pose, we extract the, the uh, silhouette lines from the image, 
we run our camera pose estimation and that gives you the position and rotation, uh, camera translation and so on for this image. So even if this was, this is just an image taken from the internet. So we didn't know where this was taken and we can, we can register those to a city scene here. So these, these are four examples of just images taken from, from the internet and just using our 3D model, uh, we can uh, position these uh, images to and register them to a city map. So this is another example application that could be interesting. Uh, and note that that for the second image here, we're actually we doesn't have the the cylinder uh, can be in any shape basically. Even if we're looking at a very strange position here, it will sort of work uh, for the equations. Okay, and we have also looked at at uh, other of these tool examples um, and trying to solve these. So we've looked at the three D reconstruction problem. So then we have, this is sort of the opposite to the last problem. We know the rotation and translation between two cameras, but we want to triangulate uh, the unknown 3D structure. So for, for points, it's basically just intersecting the, the 3D rays uh, to try to estimate the 3D point. For uh, triangles, or sorry, for, for cylinders, it becomes slightly more uh, complex and you can do it in different ways. So here, we propose a robust way uh, looking at this minimal problem and, and looking at a ransack uh, solution, but we also uh, propose uh, least square solutions to this problem. So you can solve it in different ways. Uh, but this is typically something that you need if you want to do uh, have a pipeline doing a, a SLAM-like system. So th these are our two examples uh, where we have um, 3D uh, reconstructions here. So uh, you can see the traditional point-based uh, reconstruction and then also the uh, 3D uh, cylinder reconstruction. So those are the, the uh, colored cylinders. So here you can take the, the texture from the images and paste that onto the cylinder shape. So from, this, from the algorithm, you get the, the 3D shape of the cylinder and then you can sort of give it more aesthetic feel by, by uh, just taking the images and pa paste uh, those correctly onto the uh, 3D structure. So these are two examples of doing this for 3D reconstruction. Uh, and finally, the, the so-called full structure for motion problem, then we have unknown 3D structure uh, and we have unknown uh, rotation and translation. So we're looking at two uh, cameras uh, looking at an unknown scene. So we have a number of cylinders uh, that are unknown and we have camera motion between two images. So one interesting thing here is that uh, if you look at just lines, uh, you can actually not do, you cannot solve this uh, problem if we only have lines. So if we want to estimate uh, 3D structure using 3D lines and, and projections of those, you can't solve this problem using just two images. You need three images. But even though we're just extracting lines, silhouette lines uh, from the images, in this case also, knowing this that they should be uh, on cylinders, 3D cylinders, you actually only need two, two uh, images. So you need two images and a number of, of cylinders. And we have also looked at this uh, problem. So this is the connection to the first image here. So here is shown uh, the, the uh, building that I showed you on the first uh, slide or second slide. Uh, this is the main building uh, of the university building. So here you can see both a traditional point-based uh, reconstruction uh, in blue and the black is uh, our uh, estimation based on the cylinder geometry. So this shows that you get similar uh, camera positions and estimation and, and uh, something that sort of gives you reasonable uh, 3D structure also. So all the points, these are two parallel reconstructions shown here. So the black uh, are our estimated cameras and blue is a point-based uh, sparse uh, version. So this just shows that, that 
we can still get the same type of information just using uh, these four cylinders in this case. So just extracting eight lines instead of maybe uh, 10,000 points. So it's a much simpler representation, but we still get the same uh, estimate for the cameras and arguably a more semantic structure for the 3DC. So uh, this is uh, basically uh, some work that we have done on geometry. Uh, and just something that I haven't talked about is the feature extraction. So we need to find the cylinders and the images. So this is also, of course, something that needs to be done in a robust way. You need to, to be able to do this. So we have some preliminary results working on this. So we wanted to solve this. Uh, we had some prerequisites here also. So basically, we're looking at line extraction in the first instance. Uh, and we were looking at online or real-time applications. So we wanted a, a small system. So this is a learning-based method. So we chose uh, a line detector based on, on mobile net. So we have a small. Uh, backbone, and we we work on, on this uh, MLSD uh, line detector. Uh, but we also want to be able to go to a new scene. Uh, so we want to be, uh, be able to train the model specific for maybe a forestry scene, for example. And it's difficult to get uh, ground truth data. So these models are maybe trained on indoor scenes that don't work that well on outdoor scenes. So we would like to train the model uh, specific to, to our domain. So this is the domain specific part of our, our work. And in order to do this, we have looked at semi-supervised frameworks. So we train the model on some label data, and then we want to add uh, data which is not labeled. So we want to train using unlabeled data. And there are modern ways of doing that, uh, that we have investigated. So typically what you do is that you take your data, your input image, and you perturb it or move it in some way. Uh, and then you move, you get some result and you try to move uh, that result also. So if you do a geometric transformation on the image, for instance, uh, then the lines should also that you detect should also be uh, connected to this geometric transformation. So if you do these types of augmentations, you can just, even though you don't know the ground truth, you can still put consistency loss on, on the results. So this is something that we have tried here. So we have one part, which is a consistency loss, and with one part, which is based on the labels. You have some part, which is labeled data, and you have a big part, which is unlabeled data, which is domain specific. Uh, and that works quite well. So uh, here is an example of when we have labeled free data. Uh, so on the left-hand side, we have fully supervised. Uh, so we, we have trained this uh, model on, on, on ground truth data. And then for the right-hand side, this is a model which is trained on, on uh, not uh, we've taken a part of the, the annotated data, and then we have added uh, unlabeled data and used this consistency uh, training. And of course, it's difficult to get as good results as the fully supervised results, but, but we get very close to that. So this is uh, work in, in progress. So we're, uh, this is what we're currently working. So then we want to put everything together in a big system. So this is the goal. So just to conclude now, uh, so uh, what we're trying to do is, is we want to uh, look at these mid-level representations. And we have started to look at specific geometrically constrained use cases in order to get tractable geometric problems. But of course, we want to like to extend this to, to more general models. Uh, it's not clear how you would do that exactly, but, but we're trying to investigate how can you relax these uh, models? Can you use some form of implicit representations uh, using neural architectures? But something that we can also do is we can bootstrap this process. So we can use the geometric methods. So if we have the cylinder methods, 
we can bootstrap the geometry into the learning. So we can try to learn implicit models, but train them using the explicit models in the loop in order to, to, to learn these representations. Um, and this is something that we're, we're trying to, to work at uh, now, now and in the future. Yes, that was basically uh, the talk, uh, and I'm happy to, to answer any questions that you might have.